I'm going to do something a little bit different this morning. Uh, normally, I start off with an introduction, try to whet your appetite a little bit for the text, um, and, and I give you a main point, or what we like to call around here the big idea. Um, and that usually, Lord willing, tries to relay how the passage relates to you. But this morning, I'm not going to give you an introduction, I'm just going to give you the big idea. Okay, so here's the big idea. Trust God's timing and God's ways are perfect. Okay? Trust God's timing and God's ways are perfect. Now, this big idea is very simple. In fact, uh, you may have heard something very similar to this. Maybe you've even told somebody to trust God's timing, uh, to trust his ways, that God's ways are perfect. But despite the simplicity of this message, you and I often do not practice trust in God's timing and ways. And oftentimes we think we have a better way than God. We think that we know better than God. We have better timing than God. So today, as we turn our Bibles to John chapter 7, and if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, turn to John 7 as we begin this new chapter of the book of John, as we're walking our way through John, and and that's what we do here. We pick a book of the Bible and we preach through it. So we're uh, 20th sermon in John. We're now in John 7, okay? And as we look at John 7, 1 through 24, we'll see that Jesus provides for us an example of how to trust God's timing and God's ways for our life. However, in this text today, we're not going to receive resolution. This text is going to be different to us because in this text, we don't understand God's timing. We don't necessarily understand his ways. And how often is that true in our own lives? We don't understand God's timing or God's ways. And oftentimes in our lives, we don't get resolution of why God had a particular timing for a specific event in our lives. And here in in today's text, we don't necessarily see a, a resolution. We know the resolution. We know that Jesus will die on the cross and he'll rise again. But we don't see resolution in today's text. It's very much like my six-year-old, who I didn't know was going to be joining us this morning, and uh, so I included him in the passage, but, uh, or in the, in the uh, sermon. But my six-year-old, he, he likes candy, okay? And a couple weeks ago, we, you know, had a lot of candy in our homes, right? And so he, he comes in with a huge bag. His grandma had given him a bunch of candy, and he was asking me one night if he could have more, and I told him no, and, and in a six-year-old's mind, you've got to put, it, put yourself in his shoes, right? That doesn't make sense. Why? Because candy is really good, right? So if you're thinking about a six-year-old, uh, Dad, why would you say I can't have more candy? Have you tried this candy? Do you know that this candy is really, really good? Maybe you don't understand that I like this candy, right? Like, as a six-year-old, that doesn't make sense. But if you put yourself in my shoes as a parent, uh, you understand that parents' ways aren't so mysterious, right? There's a reason, children, that we don't let you just eat a bunch of candy. We understand it tastes good. But if you eat too much candy, there are very, very bad things that will happen that parents don't want want to have to clean up. So uh, often in our life, we begin to question God, and we doubt his ways, and we doubt his timing. And John has a word for that. John calls it unbelief. And our unbelief towards God's timing really is derived from the fact that we often don't understand God and we don't have faith in what he's doing. So as we look at John chapter 7, friends, um, we're going to see Jesus giving us a great example of trusting God's timing, even though it seems really weird. And doing God's ways, and and it seems weird to us. So let's read John 7, verse 1. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand, so his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, 
my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, he is a good man. Others said, no, he is leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? (laughs) The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me on the Sabbath? I made a man's whole body well. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. That's the reading of God's word. John starts off, John 7 with giving us a period of time after this. So some period of time after John chapter 6. Well, we know about how long that would be. You see, in in John chapter 6, verse 4, we know it was about the season of Passover, which is in the spring. And now we see that is the Feast of Booths. The Feast of Booths is in October, not not too far from uh, where we're at right in this time period. So there would have been about six months between John chapter 6 and John chapter 7. Now, we see that Jesus is getting ready, uh, or the time period is the Feast of Booths, and Jesus will eventually go there. Why? Well, there's, there's three main Jewish, Jewish feasts that a, a man would, would go up to Jerusalem for. One would be Passover, the other Pentecost, and the third one would be the Feast of Booths. Now, we're fairly familiar with Passover, right? That's when they sacrifice a lamb, and, and they celebrate uh, the angel of the Lord passing over the homes that had the blood on the doorpost. We, we remember that from the Exodus. And then we're familiar with Pentecost because of Acts, and Peter preaches in Acts and shares the gospel with those people. We're not as familiar with the Feast of Booths, but the Feast of Booths celebrates when the people lived in the desert in booths or tabernacles or what we would call tents. And God told the people in Leviticus chapter 23 that they are to celebrate a feast to remind them that they lived in tents and that the Lord lived with them in tents. He tabernacled among them. And so this is kind of like a Jewish Thanksgiving, actually, uh, where the men come and and they still celebrate this today in Jerusalem where people come, they, they build little makeshift tents and some of them really decorate ornately because they eat the, the fruits of the fall, and the fruits of the fall in Israel are actually grapes and olives, okay? And they celebrate what God has done, and they rejoice, and, and it's a Thanksgiving, and it's also like a big family camp out. Kind of cool for some of us. Now, others of us don't like camping out whatsoever, right? So we're, that's not our thing. But that's what they do here, and they, and they celebrate God's presence among them. This is a time of celebration, And it would make complete sense that Jesus' brothers would approach him because all the good Jewish men would go to Jerusalem. And it would make complete sense that his brothers would say, go to Jerusalem, right? Um, They they say in verse 3, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Now, There was a reason Jesus had not gone down to Judea, down to Jerusalem for a while. He's up north in Galilee in in Podunkville, okay? There's just a bunch of little towns up there, and there's a few cities, but he's up 
in the middle of no man's land. Why? Well, because back in John chapter 5, which we covered several weeks ago, Jesus healed a man at the last feast that he went to in Jerusalem. He healed a man on the Sabbath. And not only did he heal a man on the Sabbath, but he also said that he and the Father were one. And so now the Jewish leaders want to kill Jesus. John 5, 18, they want to kill Jesus. And we know here in our text in John chapter 7, they are still seeking to kill him. Verse 1 says that. So Jesus hasn't gone down to Judea. But his brothers say, why don't you go down there? There's going to be thousands of people down there. And if you're really the Messiah, you're supposed to go to Jerusalem anyway. You're supposed to sit on the throne of David anyway. And you're doing all these miracles up north, but no one sees it, right? It'd be like if you had the world's best television show, but instead of putting it on YouTube or on a channel that anybody watches, you just put it on the local PBS station at 2 a.m. And no one's really seeing that, right? A few people wake up, they watch PBS at 2 a.m., but not very many people. Jesus, your marketing is terrible. If you're really the Messiah, go down and show people all your wonderful works. That makes sense in our mind, right? We can't blame Jesus' brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, and possibly his sisters, for saying this. It makes sense. But then look at verse 5. For not even his brothers believed in him. Can you feel the, the searing of the soul in that moment of Jesus? He's coming off of a time, yes, it was six months ago, but there was crowds of thousands upon thousands, and they leave him. And he's left with 12, but even one of the 12 is going to betray him. And now the, the, the people who are supposed to, to love him, right, his family, they don't believe. And if you, if you think about it, Jesus is the oldest brother. These are his half-brothers. But Jesus is perfect. He would have been the best big brother ever, okay? I doubt he gave James noogies. And he loves his brothers. He helped raise his brothers, no doubt. I can't imagine having Jesus as a brother. Sometimes it probably would have been annoying because I guarantee you, Mary and Joseph would have said, why can't you be more like your brother Jesus, right? He was perfect, but he would have loved them perfectly. And yet it's those brothers that he grew up with who don't believe in him. And furthermore, in John 5, John knows that his audience probably realizes that James, Jesus' brother, would later be a church leader. He believes in Jesus later. And Jude, or Judas, wrote the book of Jude. So we know at least two of Jesus' brothers believed in him later, but... That doesn't negate what's going on in this story. At this moment, Jesus' brothers refuse to believe. Why? Because this whole Messiah thing that Jesus claims to be the Messiah is one really strange. Imagine your sibling claiming to be a Messiah. You grew up with them, right? You know them. And even if it's like one of your really good siblings, you're kind of like, okay, you're, you're not the son of God, okay? That's ridiculous. But Jesus was. Now, a side application here. Some of you think that God doesn't know you're hurt. God doesn't know what it's like to be rejected. Um, but Christ does know what it means to be rejected. In fact, not only do the crowds reject him, but his family, the people who grew up with him, reject him. So some of you say, you don't know what it's like to grow up in my family. You don't know what it's like to, to be rejected by my family. But, but Jesus does. Jesus was rejected by his family, and it's to fulfill prophecy. In Psalm 69, uh, which is just amazing, there's, there's lots of messianic prophecies, but in Psalm 69, if, if you look at verse 8, uh, Jesus is rejected. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. And that's what's going on right here. And why? For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Jesus is being rejected not just by the crowds, but by his own family. 
but it's fulfilling prophecy. And in the pain and the rejection by his own brothers, what does Jesus do? Well, he answers them in John 7, 6. He says, my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. Okay, I see there's an issue there. We will work through that in a second. But look at Jesus' response to his brothers. Jesus puts his brothers in their place. The, the, the words that Jesus are using right here, he says, God has sovereignly ordained a time for me. Jesus is saying, I am special. You're not believing that I'm the Messiah, but I am special. God has orchestrated a time for me to go up to Jerusalem. And when he says go up to Jerusalem, he's saying to display who I am, to display that I am the Messiah. And then he says to his brothers, essentially, what you do is inconsequential. God hasn't appointed a time for you to go up to Jerusalem. That's special. So if you stay here or if you go up to Jerusalem, whatever. That's offensive, right? Oh, you're the son of God and you're the holy chosen one, right? You're so much, spe- so much more special than me, Jesus. Well, yeah, he, he's saying I am. But, but he does this and he, and he points out that it's not at the Feast of Booths that Jesus is to go up and to show the people that he is the Messiah. There's another feast for that, the Passover. Because there will be one day where Jesus does go up to Jerusalem, not to conquer the Romans, not to just show a whole bunch of miracles, but he goes up to Jerusalem to be the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And he'll go up to conquer sin and death and the devil. But Jesus' brothers, they don't understand that. They don't get it. It makes sense in our day and age and in all of human history that if you have power, use it. If you have prestige, grab it. Get more. And herein we see the timetables of God are different than men's. You see, um, we, we think as soon as you can, do it. And Jesus is holding off. It doesn't make sense to us. Here's the foolishness of the cross, as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Jesus' time had not fully come. The time for him was not yet to display who he was. But he does say in this text, I'm not going up to the feast, right? Um, he, he's not showing himself at this feast. My time has not yet fully come. But then, what happens in verse 10? Jesus actually goes up to the feast, right? So, is Jesus a liar? No. If he is a liar, he's not the Messiah, right? God does not lie. Um, Jesus is not lying, but what he's telling his uh, brothers is that it's not time to publicly show himself in Jerusalem. So, what, what does he do? He goes up privately, incognito. He goes in to dwell among the people, to show that God's presence is literally with the people, Right? Because after all, they're celebrating the Feast of the Booths, the Feast of the Tabernacles. And as John 1.14 says, Jesus came full of grace and truth to tabernacle among God's people. Jesus is there rejoicing with the people. But his day and his time had not come. That day and time would come. The foolishness of the cross, the timing of the cross would happen. The day when he would be spat on and ridiculed and mocked where a crown of thorns would be crushed on his head, on his skull, where his skin would be torn off by, the, by a cat of nine tails, and he would be too exhausted to carry his cross up a hill, and where he would be lifted up to fulfill what John 3.15 says, that by people just looking at the Son of Man lifted up, they might believe and be saved. Jesus doesn't explain all this in the text. He doesn't tell his brothers the timetable and everything that's going to happen. And even if he did, they wouldn't believe him. What Jesus did as the Messiah doesn't make sense to us. And it didn't make sense to uh, Jesus' brothers either. Now, um, our big idea is trust in God's timing. Trust in God's ways because they're perfect. 
But what keeps us from trusting God's timing and God's ways are perfect? At the root of it is pride. You see, Jesus tells his brothers that the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it, that its works are evil. No one likes being called evil. No one likes being called out. And what Jesus is telling his brothers is, the world can't hate you. Your timetable is inconsequential. Why? Because you belong to this world. Your ways are of this world. You don't know my father. And the world can't hate you. But the world hates me because I'm preaching against the world, because I'm saying that the world is evil and full of sin and wickedness and that the world needs a savior. The foolishness of the cross. So you and I, followers of Christ, or non-followers of Christ, why can't we simply trust God's timing and God's ways are perfect in our life? Well, I think about one area in particular is, is relationships. There are so many people who have broken relationships, whether it's a husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, fiance, uh, parents with their, their children. And, and some people ask the question, why did it not work out? Have you ever been there before? Maybe some of you are there right now. Why did God bring us together to to break us apart? What does God have in play here? We don't understand God's time. We don't understand his ways. And so the pride in our heart swells up and we say, I know better than you, God. That was the person that I should have been with. Uh, This relationship should have worked out. My child should not be walking away from me. And the pride swells up, and we become bitter towards God's timing and God's perfect ways. But despite our various timetables, worked out perfectly in our minds, is it possible that before the foundations of the world, the God who existed, the one who's all-wise, the one who is all-knowing, the one who who is all-powerful, could it be that he has a plan that is better than yours? And maybe... Maybe 20 years from now, 40 years from now, or maybe sometime in eternity, it'll make sense. But it, it's not always making sense to us right at the moment. As we continue on in the text, we see a second group of people and how we see them confuse who Jesus is. And this is going to take place the, the rest of John. There's going to be the crowds In John chapter 7, John chapter 8 especially, the crowds are going to go back and forth. Who is Jesus? Is Jesus a good man? Is he a good teacher? Or is Jesus demon-possessed? Is he wicked? Is he he bad? Well, uh, we see that Jesus um, goes into Jerusalem, and there's muttering about him. The the crowds in general, the ones who don't necessarily want to kill Jesus, but they, they think Jesus is not a good guy. And some people think that he's a good guy. They're talking, but they're talking quietly. Just like maybe in restaurants today, talk about politics quietly because you don't want people to necessarily hear because people have different opinions. You don't want to get into that, so you're quiet. And that's what's going on. And the Jewish leaders are looking to kill him. And then Jesus in John 7, 14, in the middle of the feast, he goes to the temple and in the tradition of the rabbis, he just, he goes and he posts himself up and he just starts teaching. He just starts preaching. And crowds are drawn to him. And, and, and it's amazing because later on in John chapter 7, uh, verse 46, people say, there's no one who ever spoke like this man. So I'm sorry that you have to sit through my sermons and not Jesus's, right? Because Jesus's sermons were perfect and amazing. And they People's hearts resonated with him. And the Jewish leaders, they're stunned. Why? Well, because he's speaking better than any of them, and he never went to college. And they say, how can he talk like this? And Jesus answers them in John 7, 16. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. 
Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? What Jesus is saying is, what I'm teaching, they're, they're not my words. This isn't my message. This is God's message. And Jesus is saying, God and I are one. And you would know that if you actually kept Moses' law. But even though you guys say Moses is so great and you've memorized the law, you don't keep the law. Jesus is talking about loving God's word. And if you want to love God, you would love God's word and you would keep God's word. But they're not doing that. Jesus' way is different. Jesus isn't seeking his own glory. The Jews were expecting, okay, when the Messiah comes, we're we're reading the law, and when the Messiah comes, he's going to be great and glorious, and we're obviously going to know who he is because he's going to be shedding light on himself. But Jesus says, I'm not seeking my own glory. I'm seeking the glory of my Father. And how different is Jesus than than every world leader who's who's come in and tried to be a conqueror? One of my favorite uh, Christian artists, Shy Lin, he's a Christian rapper, and he wrote a song called Jesus is Alive. And he has a line in there, or a few lines in there, uh, that are very pertinent. Nero is dead. Constantine is dead. Genghis Khan and Attila the Hun are dead. Alexander the Great is dead. However, Jesus is alive. Napoleon is dead. Lao Tzu is dead. Che Guevara and Henry VIII are dead. Saddam Hussein is dead. However, Jesus is alive. That's just a small sampling of people throughout human history who were conquerors. Every single one of those people throughout human history, they shed a light on themselves. They try to build up their platform. They try to say, here I am. I'm the deliverer. I'm the conqueror. I'm the emperor. I'm the king. Trust me. And Jesus, as he teaches in the temple, he's shedding light, not on himself, but on God's word. And he says, believe God's word. And if you believe God's word, you're going to believe me. But I'm not here for my glory. I'm here for the glory of God. How different is that than the ways of the world? And the people don't understand Jesus' words because even though they've been given the law, they do not keep it. And right before them, point blank, is right here is Jesus. And Jesus says, believe in me. And they miss it. How simple is that? And yet, how simple is the big idea? Trust God's timing and God's ways are perfect. That's a simple idea. And yet, we miss it. Why? Why don't we trust? Well, at the root is pride, to be sure. But our pride also manifests itself best when we think of God's word as foolishness. The same thing that Satan tempted Eve with back in Genesis 3, did God really say, is the same thing that you and I are tempted with all the time. We, we want our needs met. And so how can we open up a 2,000-year-old book, some of it's older, how can that be applied to my life? Is it really even pertinent? Because there's all these stories about Jesus dying on the cross. Okay, I get it. But, but what can really help me now with my needs? Historically, that path has led to wickedness. Example, in, in Germany, Martin Luther, he does his thing, and the word of God goes out, and people cherish the word of God, and they love the word of God, and, and they desire the word of God. But you know what happens after the Reformation? The Enlightenment period. In the Enlightenment period, they, they said reason and logic plus God's word is, is going to bring us hope. But you know what happened after the Enlightenment period, or the tail end of the Enlightenment period, is modernity. And in modernity, they have higher criticism. In higher criticism, they question the validity of God's word. Is it even practical? I don't think these miracles are really true. Let's just take the good teachings of Jesus, try to apply some of these things to our lives. But really, um, in higher criticism, what comes out is Darwinianism and Marxism and all sorts of things. How did that play out for Germany? As there was a famish of the word of God, there's a famine of the word of God in Germany, what happens? World War I. And then there's even a further famine of the word of God. And what happened? People replaced human logic and what they felt was most important. Hitler rises to power. People are persecuted. 
World War II. And now today, in Germany, even though that was one of the birthplaces of the Reformation where the Word of God went out, it is dark. People don't believe because there's a famine of the Word. So too in our society. As many people lament the state of our culture in the U.S., we turn to the auspices of hope in politics. Now, I'm not saying that Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. Actually, quite the opposite. But I will assure you, friends, that you will not change the U.S. or anybody or the world apart from the word of God. What is the only thing that brings life where there's death? God's word. You want to know why we're in such the state that we are? A state in which... Um, you know, we think of conservatism equals Christianity, and out in Montana, that's a conservative place. They voted this last week to, to not offer health care to babies who are born, okay? So if, so if a baby's trying to be aborted and the baby's born, they can just let it die or just leave it there, kill it. That's utter wickedness. I read in Christianity Today this week, in the most recent Christianity Today, they had a poll And 55% of evangelical women, 45 years and younger, are pro-LGBTQ. 45% of men, evangelical men, 45 years and younger, are pro-LGBTQ. Friends, why are we here? Because there is a famine of God's word in our culture. And whose fault is it? It is the fault of the pulpit. Because people do not preach God's word. It is God's word that brings life, not just good thoughts. God things bring life, not good things. And so what we have is generations of preaching that people desire something. Give me a list. Give me five ways to raise my kids. Give me ten ways to have a healthy healthy marriage. And I've sat through sermons like that where people might throw in a Bible verse or two. Sometimes there's no word of God. And I don't disagree with anything they say. But they don't give us God's word. And what has happened is we as a nation are famished because we do not have God's word because it has not been preached from the pulpits. And so we don't Believe God's word. And so, friends, if you want to change our culture, be a people who love the word of God. Don't just have it in your homes. Probably all of you have Bibles upon Bibles. Don't just have them in your homes. Just don't have an app on your phone. Open God's word. You will change your heart. You will change society. If you want to be different, if you want to be different, if you want to rescue the United States, what you need to do is read your Bible. Study your Bible, teach your Bible, raise your kids to love the Bible, talk about the word of the Bible, pray the words of the Bible. The people don't believe Jesus. And he says, that's why you're seeking to kill me. And they say, you have a demon. Who's seeking to kill you? Even though we know that the Jewish leaders are seeking to kill him. And Jesus answers in verse 21, I did one work, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Herein we see once more the people rejecting the ways of God. You see, the Jewish people, they wanted to keep the law and what the law said is that if a, if a baby is born, a baby boy is born on the eighth day, they have to be circumcised, okay, to show the sign of the covenant. So if a baby is born on the Sabbath, then what happens eight days later on the Sabbath? The baby is to be circumcised. And so that's what they do. They do it because they want to keep the law. But they missed out on the idea that Jesus has come to fulfill the law, and Jesus has come with grace. And we have to look back at John chapter 5 to see what's going on. In John chapter 5, Jesus comes up to this man at the pool of Bethesda. This man has been paralyzed for much of his life, and Jesus looks at the man, and he asks him a question, and the man gives an answer. He says, yeah, no, no one's been able to put me in this, this little pool, this pool that we believe an angel stirs up, and the first one in is, is saved, is 
is healed. And Jesus doesn't offer to put the man in the pool. Jesus just heals the man. The man never asked to be healed. <laughs> Jesus does it. And then later on, the, the man really proves himself really to be a stinker because he just tells on Jesus <laughs> to the leaders. He never thanks Jesus for making him better. And it is that reason that the Jewish people want to kill Jesus. And Jesus is saying, you're missing the point. If it's okay to do good works by keeping the law on the Sabbath, how much better is it if I heal somebody completely on the Sabbath? You're missing the point of grace. And that's what Jesus is trying to show them. Not just God's timing is different and God's ways are different. That's true. But the way of grace is different than the way of the law. Pride is at the root, for sure. And a rejection of God's word is how we, we see pride manifest all over. But so often we reject God's word because we refuse to believe grace. Grace doesn't make sense to us. You know why preachers preach five, raise, five ways to raise your kids or, or ten ways to a healthy marriage? You know why preachers did that? Because people said, we want list. Just tell me how to live my life. So I can have a nice little checklist and I can go down the line and say, yep, I love my wife because I follow these 10 ways to love my wife. Or yep, I'm a good dad because I follow these five ways to raise my kids. That's called felt needs. And we like those felt needs because we think that if we can keep a list, that God will be approving of us. That God will look down and say, oh, wow, Chase, you're a good guy. <laughs> you're, you're following those lists. Wow, 10 ways to, to have a healthy marriage and chase. Wow, you followed all of them. Wonderful. But that's not how we're saved. We're saved by the gospel of grace. Now, we're called to good works for sure. We're called to good works after we have been saved. But friends, we confuse it just like the Jews. We confuse the word of God. We confuse grace. We're thinking that we have to earn the affections of God. We cannot earn the affections of God whatsoever. God is not more pleased with you because you read your Bible and you pray and you love your wife or you love your, your spouse, your husband, and you love your kids. God's not more pleased with you because of that. Because what the Bible teaches is that we are all sinners and we all fall very short of the glory of God. So we're saved by the grace of God in Jesus Christ and in Christ alone. There's one person who could please God completely and that person was Jesus and what Jesus is trying to show them is that there is a different way, friends, than just keeping the law because you never can do enough. Had the Jews been able to heal anybody on the Sabbath? No, they were able to do some of the works of the law, but they were limited. Jesus wasn't limited. And Jesus said, I'm here to offer grace. We don't understand that. It doesn't make sense to us because so much of life is if you're talented uh, or, or if you work hard, you can achieve power and prestige and everything else that comes with it. And so grace is foolish to us. But grace is the way that God saves. And the foolishness of the word of God and the foolishness of grace is seen here in John 7 when Jesus says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. If you want the wisdom of God, you have to know the words of God, and you have to believe him who he sent. And who did God send? He sent Jesus. And Jesus says, believe in me. So, so many of us, we don't understand the ways of grace. We don't understand God's ways. We don't understand his timing. And we say, okay, how is the Bible really practical to me? Some Christians, some non-Christians. And some of you go, okay, I know we're working our way through John, and I know the gospel's important, but how does that help me in my practical daily life? Because I'm struggling with despair. Or I'm struggling with my spouse threatening to leave me, or our marriage is rocky. Or I hate my job, so what do I do? Or I, I've been single for so long. How, how is just knowing Jesus came to save me? How is that actually practical in my life? Maybe you're over your head with your children or the daily grind of life is crushing you or maybe you're struggling with the disease and you say, 
okay, this is, this is all good, but I don't understand God's timing and God's ways. This makes absolutely zero sense to me. But friends, it's, it's, it's here that we realize that God's timing and God's ways are perfect because God is perfect. And he's working in your life. And some of you go, I don't know how he's working. I, 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 don't, I don't know what to do. Trust means to rest. Trust means to rest in God. It's not, it's not a, a stupid trusting. Okay, my life's terrible, but I'll just trust God. No, it, it's looking at all the circumstances of life all around you and saying, God is still good. William Cooper who wrote, uh, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. He struggled with um, what we would call depression nowadays. He was in a mental institution back in the 1700s. The Lord saved him. He still struggled with despair for much of his life. But in 1774, he wrote another hymn. This hymn is called God Moves in a Mysterious Way. And it says this. God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep and unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. You fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a better taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err, and scan his work in vain. God in, is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. We don't see resolution in our text. Jesus says, judge with right judgment. And we're in, in the middle of a conversation and, and people are wondering whether or not this can be the Christ. And we, we see Jesus go up and he's not showing his miracles. He's not showing necessarily who he is. He just teaches. He, he unleashes his word. Friends, can you trust the word of God in your life with whatever you're going through? You can. You can because his promises are true. He is true and he is good. And friends, may God be gracious to you as you navigate your various trials in this life. Because as the last line says, not with blind unbelief, but knowing who God is. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain one day.